Your Turn to Die, Death Game by Majority, is a Japanese episodic visual novel about Sarah Chiruin, a regular high school girl who, along with her friend Joe, is kidnapped by some mysterious organization and forced to participate in a killing game. This is probably not a groundbreaking concept to you if you're someone who has even a passing interest in visual novels or were alive by the height of Hunger Games and or Danganronpa, depending on how old and mentally ill you were in about 2008 to 2014. In fact, if you saw Your Turn to Die Out in the Wild, you might initially think of it as a bit of a cheap knockoff, or like even a fan game of something like Danganronpa or Zero Escape. However, you would be wrong. Like, about as wrong as you possibly can be. Your Turn to Die is a beast of its own that pulls clear inspiration from its predecessors, but cleverly subverts expectations as well as improving upon mistakes made by its contemporaries. The game is still in development, with all but the final main game being available to play right now, and if you haven't played it, you absolutely should. This game is easily up there with something like Buried Stars as a personal favorite of mine, and even if you don't typically enjoy this type of game, I'm absolutely willing to stake my reputation, whatever that's worth, on recommending this to you. This video is going to contain spoilers, but I am going to go in segments using the same chapter structure as the game itself to make sure that you always have an off-ramp if you either haven't played it yet already, or just haven't finished it yet, or you watch part of it and realize you want to play it so you don't want to spoil too much more. Anyways, back to the game itself. Your Turn to Die makes its stance on player choice clear right from the jump. An unknown man asks you if you're familiar with the concept of a majority vote, and explains it to you by showing you Mr. Blue and Miss Red, who love and hate majority votes respectively. You're asked to vote for whichever one you most agree with, and after choosing, the other is immediately executed. You don't get to choose not to vote, but more crucially, there is no correct option. And this sets the tone for the game that you're about to experience. Your Turn to Die's narrative is great in and of itself, like that alone would make it a game worth playing. But what makes it a truly amazing game, what brings it up a level, are the moments where you're making a choice about who lives and who dies. The choices are brutal, the consequences can be unpredictable, and it all culminates in an experience that's really hard to compare to any other game in its field. Before we get into it properly, this is your final spoiler warning, but let me just explain how the spoilers in this video are going to work. Your Turn to Die is released in chapters, with each chapter being broken up into parts 1 and 2. Part 1 of each chapter covers the sub-game, which is like a mini-game that they play before they get into the actual thing, and part 2 covers that chapter's main game. This video is going to go through this part by part, in order, and nothing from a future part of the game will be discussed prior to getting to that part of the video. If you've only played up to chapter 2 part 1, for example, you can watch the first three chapters of this video without any spoilers. I mean, mostly. See, this is a game about branching narratives, and we'll cover how those narratives branch out in each section, so even if you've played that far along in one branch of it, it'll still spoil the other path for you. If you have not played the game, again, please play it. The game has been made available for free online, you can get a free translation there, and I'll also include the link in the description for that, but you can buy it on Steam for like 15 bucks if you want to. It's a pretty short game, and you won't regret trying it out. Anyways, you've been warned, let's get to the video. Chapter 1, Part 1. The Trials. The game opens on Sarah Chidwin, a generally normal high school girl, and her friend Joe Tazana. Some small talk happens, and then Joe offers to walk Sarah home to help keep her safe. She's been dealing with a stalker lately, and so she accepts his deal. As they're walking, they do encounter someone lurking around in the dark who yells at them not to go home, but they understandably ignore him. They soon get to Sarah's house, only to find Sarah's mother unconscious on the floor. Sarah tries to run up to her room, only to get grabbed by mysterious hands, scream, and then be knocked unconscious. <laughs> Joe, hearing the scream, follows her up, only to get grabbed himself. An unknown amount of time later, Sarah and Joe wake up strapped to big metal beds in a strange white room, and are informed that this is their first trial. They have five minutes to escape the room, or they'll die. Chapter 1 Part 1 has a general vibe of, like, escape room point-and-click games for the most part, and this is the first one you'll encounter. The whole sub-game is the trials, if that gives you any sort of indication about what everyone else is going through right now. Joe lets himself out with a key and then has to solve a puzzle to save Sarah as well. If he fails, the bed's gonna bear trap on her, so time is of the essence here. They escape and flee down a hall, only for the floor to fall out from under them. They're dropped into a lobby area and meet nine other participants. Kazumi Mishima, Reko Yabasami, Kai Sato, Kitaro Bergerberg, Keiji Shinogi, now Egokoro, Sohiyori, Kana Kizuichi, and Gin Ibushi, all of whom are wearing a strange metal collar just like Sarah and Joa found on themselves, and the game begins in earnest.
you're told that you're supposed to reassemble a doll and have been given her head to start with. Along the way, you'll play some Russian roulette hosted by this weird guy named Meister, but I'm sure he won't come up later. Solve some puzzles and discover that there were originally far more than 11 participants. The bar has a list of 20 names divided up into the 11 who were old enough to drink and the 9 who weren't. It's not hard to deduce that the other 9 people that you haven't encountered yet likely didn't survive their first trials. Throughout this process, Sarah realizes that Kai is her stalker, the one that her and Joe saw when they were walking home together. By investigating the building, you find arms, legs, and a torso for the doll, and reassembling them results in the appearance of Sue Miley, the floor master of the first floor. She explains to the participants that they are going to be playing a death game by majority vote, and that they're going to do a quick practice run. Now, gaming as a medium has a weird relationship with the concept of choices in large part, I would argue, because it's a pretty revolutionary approach to the whole idea of a standard narrative structure. We don't really do branching narratives in other media because it's just not really feasible. Getting audience input midway through the presentation of a scripted piece of media like a book, movie, or TV show and then reacting accordingly is just not really an option. The closest we can get is stuff like choose your own adventure books, and even that tends to pale in comparison to what gaming can offer on this front. There's also tabletop games like Dungeons & Dragons, but that's almost too individualized to compare here. It relies on a human being that can actively engage with the players and build the narrative with them rather than a single commercial product that can engage with all players who might pick it up. And players are allowed to pick and choose what parts of that world they want to build with. They don't have to use everything in the rulebook of Dungeons & Dragons, but video games don't work like that. And to complicate everything even further, on top of that, unlike something like a tabletop game, the nature of choice in video games isn't really set in stone. It's pretty flexible, which means that any game that does offer the player some degree of power in the decision-making process needs to first teach them what kind of choices they'll be expected to make. For your turn to die, that takes the form of this first practice vote. You don't know the purpose of the vote, but you are free to vote for anyone in the room. However, it's a false choice. The game is teaching you a mechanic, but it's also not going to make you live with a permanent choice that you yourself had control over. Most players seemingly just vote for themselves, with one notable exception, Mishima. Unbeknownst to you, he'd ask Nao, who was his student, to vote for him, promising to vote for her as an act of trust only to also vote for himself. Meanwhile, a third person also voted for Mishima for some reason, meaning that he has at least three votes and is the winner regardless of how you voted. Now, this is a little nitpick of mine throughout this game, but this is not a majority vote. A majority vote would mean a majority voted for Mishima, that would have been 6 out of 11. What he won is a plurality vote, or like first past the post type shit, which is just more votes than anyone else, and it is very different. Anyway, moving on, this is not important. While Sue Miley presented this as a practice vote, and Sue Miley, Smiley, whatever, the only sense in which that was actually the case is that there was no deliberation stage, there wasn't multi-round voting, and there weren't any secret roles that the main game would have. However, she never said nobody would die. Mishima's collar begins to vibrate and then glow white hot, and it sears right through his neck to decapitate him. The players, in particular now, are understandably having a bad time of it right about now. However, it's about to get even worse for them, as they turn around to discover that, on the back of the door to the room, were instructions for the practice vote. The person with the most votes would die, but if there'd been a tie vote, nobody would have died. Lesson learned. Read the fine print. There are rules to the game, and while your choice as an individual was nullified by the nature of a tutorial, you as a group have now been taught that you will be given the power to choose, and that the game expects you to take the initiative to figure out how to work within the rules to win. It also gives you a bit of hope. That there will be ways to beat the game, that there's always a way to keep everyone alive if only you think outside the box. It's a hard way to learn that lesson, but at least now you've learned it. Maybe. However, the tutorializing isn't done here. And that's where we move on to... Chapter 1, Part 2. The first main game. As the characters scatter post-Mishima beheading, they begin to encounter mysterious glowing cards all around the facility. Sarah encounters one that calls her the Keymaster, which says that if she loses the main game, everyone dies. In other words, this is the main character card. Again, solidifying that you're not truly being dropped in the deep end just yet. No matter what you do, you realistically can't lose the next vote. Now, quick story thing that happens here, we've lost Mishima, but we actually gained someone. Gonbi Yamada, a weird guy in a prison jumpsuit who's hiding in a locker in one of the puzzle rooms. 
He mistakenly thought that Sarah was a murderer after watching her be the shooter in the Russian roulette game that you ended up actually winning, but whatever. Anyways, initially he's pretty uncooperative. We do some other story stuff, some people get attacked, some people attack them, some people get stuck in some traps, it's a whole thing, but eventually we get to the main game itself. The characters are all dropped into their own little banquets on the second floor before entering the voting area, where they'll each stand on a podium that doubles as an hourglass. Although, again, a bit of a misnomer, because they aren't actually ever given an hour. They're told that they'll get 70 minutes in the preliminary round of deliberations, at which point they'll vote for someone. Then, the top half of the roster with votes, in this case 5 of the 11, will advance to the final round. At this point, there will be another 20 minutes of discussion, followed by a final vote for someone to be executed between the finalists. <laughs> Yeah, or did I say that guy's name was Gombi Yamada? Uh, yeah, that's actually a lie. His real name is Alice Yabasame, and the observant among you might recognize that last name from Reko. Turns out, that's not a coincidence. They're siblings with a complicated past, particularly thanks to the murder that Alice committed. Who did he kill? Not important yet, We're, we don't have to get into that. He maintains his innocence, but I mean, it's Japan. Even if he was truly innocent, it's not like it would have done him much good. Just like what happened with Sarah, each of the other characters has also picked up a roll card, and Sue Miley explains their mechanics to them at the beginning. The key master is, as mentioned, the main character role. If the group votes to execute that person, everyone dies. There's also the sage, who knows the identity of the key master, meaning that they can keep the entire group safe by identifying the key master. This is important because the final role here is that of the sacrifice, who will be executed unless they're the one who gets voted out, at which point they and one other person of their choosing would get to escape. The Sacrifice also gets a bonus vote to help themselves in this process. The rest of the participants are commoners, with no special powers. However, we're still in tutorial mode here, meaning that we're about to get familiar with the mechanics of the main game. You're allowed to choose which conversation paths to follow, but broadly speaking, power is out of your hands here. One of the most unique aspects of video games as a medium is the concept of the audience having agency in that narrative. The player isn't just passively observing, but is actively engaging with the media, and as a result, they expect their input to have a satisfying output. On a super basic level, that just means stuff like if you shoot an enemy, you expect them to react by being shot. But on a bigger narrative level, it means that the audience wants to actually impact the story in some way. However, if you've played more than a handful of games, you know that this is a lot easier said than done. It's really easy to feel like a passive spectator being dragged from place to place while you just check the boxes along the way, or to feel like you can engage with the story a lot, but only in very surface level ways. On the flip side, you also need to actually teach the player how to engage with choices, and it's easier to do that if you make it relatively low stakes out of the gate by not imposing the power of life and death on them. Your turn to die recognizes this, and while the consequences of the game are now clear to the players, they know they're voting for someone to die, the outcome of this vote is predetermined. No matter what you do, the voting can only go one way. And this might feel like a bit of a letdown, honestly. You've been promised this game where your choices matter. But something that your turn to die understands is that you can also get something out of taking the choice away from the player if they know that that's been taken. Making a horrible outcome inevitable, making you feel like you couldn't have done anything, and making it all come down to a cold hard calculation between the entire cast, all of that can be good if done right. And your turn to die does it brilliantly. Instead of a situation like in Danganronpa where you have to find a culprit who did kill someone already so that it's at least a little bit, you know, morally justifiable to the participants, everyone in the cast here has to try and suss out who they can and cannot vote for, not because of their guilt or innocence, but because of how much of a risk it poses to everyone else, and who they are or aren't willing to kill if it comes down to it. And this is what you're learning about in this main game. In the first round of voting, Sarah, Joe, Kana, So, and Kai receive the most votes and advance to the final round, with both Sarah and So claiming to be Keymaster. In the finals, more claims are made. Joe and Kana both claim to be the Sage and identify Sarah and So respectively as the Keymaster. It becomes clear quickly, however, that any one of them could be lying. Nobody who was eliminated in the first round had indicated that they held any roles, meaning that the final five likely includes the Sage, Keymaster, Sacrifice, and two commoners. As it stands, there's a 40% chance that a random vote would kill them all, between either the Keymaster or the Sacrifice. Eventually, Sarah realizes that neither Kana nor Joe were the Sage. It was Kai all along. The Sage is a dangerous role in this game because it's the safest one to eliminate, because you know with absolute certainty that that person will not have a negative consequence. They can't hold the Sacrifice card or the Keymaster. And Kai was desperately hoping nobody would figure it out. However, at this point, he's forced to reveal his identity, exposing himself as the true Sage, Sarah as the true Keymaster, and Joe as the Sacrifice. Joe's plan had been to prove himself as the Sage, get voted out, and then get to save himself and Sarah at the expense of the others. It's cruel, but he had no choice but to play the card he'd been dealt. The players vote, and no matter what you choose, Kai is selected by the group.
you don't get the option of a happy ending where you and Joe escape together, and there's no way for So or Kana to end up on the chopping block here. If we're looking at the text purely from the lens of choices and branching narratives, chapter one as a whole is all about the lack of power you have. You are not a leader yet. You don't get to have the final say, you're just one of a dozen-ish people stuck in this situation together and power is firmly shared within the group. Maybe not equally, but you certainly don't have the majority share here. It enforces a feeling of powerlessness, of inevitability, and of tragedy. And nothing hammers this home quite like the finale. After the votes have been cast and counted, Sue Miley confirms Sarah's assertion. Sarah was Keymaster, Kai was Sage, and Joe was Sacrifice. Joe is to be executed first, and a flurry of metal tubes fly out to impale him before sucking all the blood from his body. That's already pretty bad, like that's a pretty gruesome way to kill someone, especially a child, because remember, Joe is like a high school kid. But then, Sue hands Sarah a little button, telling her every time she presses it, it'll delay Joe's death just a little longer. Maybe she can even save him. Who knows if you don't try. You can choose to hammer that button furiously, or you can choose to let it run out, but you cannot choose whether Joe survives. His death is inevitable, and the only choice he really had was between whether or not you'd accept his fate or prolong his suffering. Again, choice as a tool of the narrative doesn't mean that you get to choose everything. Sometimes it's about taking that choice away from you and taunting you about how powerless you are, and the button is an excellent example of how to do that. Regardless of what you do, Sarah canonically keeps pushing the button, even after he dies. She couldn't save her friend, and as the player, you know that there was nothing you could have really done to change this. It's meant to kind of break you the same way it breaks Sarah. But things aren't even over yet, because we've still got Kai. And Kai has taken advantage of the commotion over Joe to slit his own wrist with a kitchen knife he'd picked up along the way, denying Sue Miley the pleasure of the execution. Kai's whole deal is still incredibly confusing to Sarah and the player. He was her stalker, it seems, and it also seems that he was involved with the kidnappers, but there must be more to him. Like, he lost this round, which you would assume probably wouldn't happen if he was an infiltrator from the bad guys, but he was also the one who seemingly guided Sarah towards the Keymaster card. But if he was on the side of the kidnappers, then it'd be a bit strange that he died. Regardless, we're now up to three fatalities. Mishima, Kai, and Joe. I mean, technically we're up to 11 if we include the 8 who failed to survive their first trials, but either way we're down to 9 participants. Sarah, Keiji, Kitaro, So, Kana, Nao, Gin, Reko, and Alice. And it's at this point that the training wheels really start to come off. Chapter 2, Part 1. The Trust Barter. Now, something I want to mention about how this game works is that you don't get to go seamlessly from section to section, from part to part. Once you complete one part of the game, it'll send you back to the main menu where you get to press the chapter select button or whatever. And from there, you get to choose where you want to start from. Wherever you pick, it'll show you a bit of a recap of what's happened so far. And if there have been any choices up to that point, you get to decide which choice happened in this run. So if you made a choice one way, but you decide you want to change it for a different run, you can do that. Anyways, Sarah starts chapter two experiencing a little bit of a mental health crisis, like just a, just a smidge, which is, I would argue, pretty fair considering what just happened. She begins seeing hallucinations, most prominently of Joe, who appears as this super freaky little red sprite with these black hollow eyes. It is not my favorite. I do not enjoy hallucination Joe. We will not be spending a lot of time looking at him because there's also just a lot of other stuff to get to here. The participants are moved up to the third floor and are met by this floor's floor master and vice floor master, Rhea Ranger and Tia Safflin, or Rhea Ranger and Tears and Suffering. And the two of them explain the rules of the next subgame, the Trust Barter. They explain that there are a series of carnival games all over the third floor, and each one, once completed, will reward participants with what are called clear chips if they can finish them. It'll kill them if they don't, so you kinda gotta win. Participants need to get 10 clear chips to move on to the main game by the end of the third day, and they'll be killed if they don't have enough. The games range from extremely simple to extremely challenging, with stuff like the dancing minigame being notoriously hard, and they all must be completed in pairs. However, you can only attempt each game once. I mean, like I said, if you lose, you die, but if you win, you also can't go back and repeat one that you know you can beat. Each participant has also been given 100 me tokens, a currency that's going to be used throughout the subgame. 
Participants can spend me tokens in the prize exchange to buy an advantage in the minigames for 10 tokens, two of the much needed clear chips to skip some games for 30 tokens apiece, three victim videos showing what happened to three of the people who failed to survive their first trial for 20 tokens each, and personal info files about each of the participants for 50 tokens each. There's also a secret exit ticket that you can buy for a whopping 200 tokens, although that doesn't come up until a little bit later. The catch here is that you can't spend your own tokens. You need to barter with the others to get theirs. The personal info files require 50 of that specific person's tokens to unlock, while the rest of the prizes can be purchased with any combination of tokens that doesn't include your own. Anyways, once all of this has been explained and some story stuff happens, you're effectively let loose to complete the games at your own pace while the story happens between attractions. You can choose the order, and through doing so, you might even be able to choose to avoid some minigames you don't want to do. You can choose who you partner with for them to get extra bonuses and special effects, and you can choose who to negotiate with between games. Sometimes someone just wants to talk with you, while others will offer you tokens in a fair exchange or they'll ask you to do something for them. Throughout this process, Sarah is also trying her absolute goddamn hardest to not get jump scared by Joe, which can be remarkably difficult. Sometimes they just kind of happen for story purposes, but sometimes you accidentally do that point and click thing where you're just methodically smashing your way through the screen and you accidentally click on a Joe hallucination that you didn't see yet. I want to touch the fraction. I didn't even notice who was there until I clicked. Well, too late. I'm so mad at myself right now. I was just clicking around because I was like, this room's empty, there's nothing in here. It's not fun, but you are given another choice here. Safflin offers to help you with your hallucinations with a machine of hers that zaps out any memories you wish to forget. Sarah's hallucinations will get worse if she keeps interacting with them, meaning that you need to deliberately avoid anything that might trigger a spiral for her. But if you fuck up, you can ask her to help you forget Joe for a bit, but it's only temporary, and you can only do this a couple times before your brain will melt. It's not just that the hallucinations get, like, scarier for the player, they also increase your hallucination score, and if that hits 100, Sarah dies. There's a lot going on narratively in this area, and I won't go beat by beat through the story with you, but one important detail is that you enter a room called the Room of Lies with Reko at the start of day two. Inside is a table with six clear chips and a rope with a note calling it the Web of Happiness. Kurumi Tojo stands in the audience might recognize this neat little concept. Reko grabs the chips and Sarah grabs the rope, only for the lights to shut off. The two panic and run for the door, with Sarah grabbing Reko's hand and Reko screaming, only for Sarah to discover once she's escaped that she's only holding onto Reko's glove. Weirdly enough, Reko then comes out wearing both gloves, and is a little bit confused about the whole thing, but they kind of just move on from there. One of the reasons why choice in games is difficult is the same as why it's difficult in real life. Decision paralysis. Being asked to make a choice is hard, especially when there's a lot of options and you know that they could have serious consequences. Decision paralysis is something that anyone can experience, but is especially common among people with anxiety, depression, ADHD, stuff like that. Your brain is racing, trying to identify every possible option, every possible outcome, and every possible consequence, which makes it impossible to make a decision without just losing your fucking mind. In Your Turn to Die Chapter 2 Part 1, there's a lot of that going on. Which characters do you trade tokens with? I mean, if you get enough of a specific character's tokens, you might be able to unlock part of their backstory. What do you spend those tokens on? An advantage in the minigames would obviously be a big help, as would the clear chips, but aren't you at least a little curious about what happened to the others who didn't make it? Or the others who did? Who do you bring with you into the attractions? Each one of them provides a unique advantage to you, and your failure will kill them. So pick carefully. You've been told that there's a secret exit ticket available for 200 tokens. What happens if someone gets that far? How do you keep track of how many tokens everyone's got? What if the tokens also play a role in the main game and it's best to hoard them? You only have 100 of your own. What happens if someone gets enough of them to get your own personal information? What happens if you run out and you can't trade with people anymore? Your turn to die replaces the anxiety of having no control with the anxiety of having too much control, of not knowing what's going to happen next, but knowing that it will be your fault, that you had control. The tokens create pressure to spend wisely without knowing what would be a wise investment, without any understanding of the true value of the currency. And of course, it's a trust bartering thing, it's all about trust. Who can you trust with your tokens, and who can trust you with theirs? The game creates a lot of pressure to choose your allies and your negotiation partners carefully, particularly as some will demand tokens from you if you're going to talk to them. The negotiations process creates pressure to choose the right partners to improve relationships, to get more tokens, and to navigate the trust barter as a whole. There's just too much choice, and not enough information, and once again, your turn to die is hammering home that you're not going to be allowed to have your cake and eat it too. You learn that it was maybe easier when you didn't have to make decisions. Now it's on you to get it right. And you can fuck that up. All of this comes to a head at the end of day three. All nine participants have collected enough clear chips to advance, and so they move into the final attraction, the arbitration room. In the arbitration room, participants are being sorted by their total token count at the end. 
Kitaro had the most, followed by Kana, Alice, So, and Keiji, with Sarah, Nao, and Reko falling below them, and Gin ending up with the least. Then, Kana, Alice, So, and Keiji are trapped in a box, Sarah, Nao, and Reko are lifted onto a raised platform, and Gin and Kitaro are strapped to a target. They're informed that Gin will be shot with a poison dart every time a timer expires, but that Kutaro has the ability to hit a switch and swap places with him at any time he chooses. Kana, Alice, So, and Keiji are effectively useless. They're unable to offer anything except for suggestions, with it coming down to Sarah, Nao, and Reko to figure out how they're going to get out of there. This is also a long, protracted discussion that I'm not going to ruin for you, but I will tell you where choice eventually comes into it. Eventually, they discover that one of the tiles on that platform is loose. Pulling it up reveals a long fall into a spike pit. However, by dropping some tile pieces into it, they discover that it's actually a scale. If they can just hit a high enough weight, they can deactivate the trap and save everyone. Well, everyone except for whoever's going to have to go down the hole. The string that they have from the Room of Lies turns out to be too weak to hold a person, and the weight required is going to require either Now, Reko, or Sarah to sacrifice themselves. A little bit fucked up, huh? However, it's going to get even more confusing in a second because it turns out that the Reko that's with them is not the real Reko, but a doll imbued with an AI made to mimic Reko. And this seems like this gives you actually a pretty easy answer. Like, just kill the doll, it's not a person. But so and Kana point out that she is functionally no different than a human at this point as she sobs and begs them not to kill her. At this point, you're faced with a choice. Do you push fake Reko into the pit, saving Gin? Or refuse and keep trying to find another way? Just like every other decision in this part of the game, you don't really know what the outcome will be. It's impossible to know what to do here, and for some people you might think there's not even really a choice at all. However, you can choose to mash the button to push Reko, or you can refuse to do so. You've been told that someone is going to have to be sacrificed to end the game, and you're either picking Gin or Fake Reko. Now, I'll tell you what I did, and that's push Fake Reko. I didn't even hesitate. Maybe it's because generative AI shit is really poisoning against AI in general, or maybe it's because objectively speaking she's just not a human being and Gin is, or maybe it's because if anything bad happened to Gin, I would kill everyone and then myself. Who's to say? Uh, me, I'm to say, it's the third one. Anyways, you might think, it's fine, this is just a doll, we're just solving the puzzle. Alternatively, you might simply think, I can't keep doing this, I can't be responsible for more killing. You might also think, all character deaths so far have been determined by the narrative. Surely no matter who I pick, whoever's meant to die is still gonna die, right? Ha. If you choose to try and push Reko, you're going to have to mash the button to push her closer and closer to the edge, but you will not have to push her off the edge. Now he's going to barge in and shoulder check her into the pit to save you that responsibility. If you don't, Kutaro will finally decide to flip that switch and take a shot for Gin after, like, he allowed a child to take multiple of them. Either way, the game ends. Some of the characters rush to go at some antidotes, but you go with Now to the Room of Lies to try and find the real Reko. If you push the fake Reko, you're accompanied by Alice. If you didn't, fake Reko's gonna meet you there. There's also an outcome where you like failed to realize that Reko was a fake, which plays out the same way as if you just didn't push her. In the pushed Reko route, which again is one I did, you enter the room with Alice and now to find Ranger. Alice demands to know where Reko is, and after Ranger mocks him, Safflin brings in Reko's decapitated head. Alice rushes to attack Ryo, but Ranger throws the head at him, and he catches it. And then it immediately explodes, punching a hole right through his torso. Alice dies in seconds, and only after he's expired is the real Reko allowed to enter the room. She'd just been kidnapped in the Room of Lies, and now she's finally free. But Alice died believing that Reko was dead too. Which, like, pretty fucked, not gonna lie. And now you might be thinking that, like, the didn't push Reko route's gonna be better. Again, ha. In that route, you enter to find Ranger with both Rekos and are forced to do the classic how do I know which one of you is the real Reko thing. Actually, I misspoke. You aren't forced to do it, because as Ranger snarkily reminds you, not everything's about Sarah. 
now is going to be the one picking here. As both Reko's callers start beeping, Ranger produces a knife, and one of the Reko's threatens to kill them all if Now doesn't pick her. Now reasons that the real Reko wouldn't do that, and so chooses to save the other one. And she chose correctly, congratulations! Uh, but then the fake Reko uses her last moments to murder the real Reko in the hopes that she'll be allowed to continue in her place. Hopes are dashed as that fake's collar explodes too, leaving both Rekos dead. At this point in both routes, the receptionist doll reveals himself to be named Gashu, and unlike the other floor masters, he's not a doll. He is a real human being running this shit. He kills Ranger and takes over as the floor master, and will lead them all into the main game shortly. This is the first major divergent point in Your Turn to Die. Up until this point, everyone playing the game will have been experiencing the same game, with the same characters and the same core narrative. Chapter 2 marks the point at which the experience will start to change for people because the subgame allowed for a huge amount of variation in terms of the exact individual experience, but ultimately those changes were relatively minor. The narrative continued on mostly unscathed. However, as we now know, that changes at the end of Part 1. There is no way to continue with both Reko and Alice alive. And you didn't know that was the choice you were making when you were asked to push Reko into the pit. I mean, for one, Alice wasn't even in that discussion, like he had nothing to do with any of this up until he got exploded, and yet he's suddenly on the chopping block. You thought you were making a choice between saving Gin and saving fake Reko, when those choices were actually the decision to kill Alice or kill Reko respectively. Your turn to die confronted you with overwhelming choices throughout this part to lure you into a false sense of security, a feeling that, while it might be hard to make a decision, they're ultimately relatively inconsequential. Everyone gets enough clear chips no matter who you pair up with, and unless you accidentally gave Kyutaro 200 chips and he kills everyone to escape, or you had a mental breakdown because of the Joe hallucinations, you'll inevitably end up in the arbitration room with everyone in the same positions. The breaking point with Reko and Alice is done to make it clear that your choices do genuinely matter now. Over the course of the narrative up until this point, you as Sarah have become the leader of this group, even if it's a bit informal, and it is on you to decide who lives and who dies. You don't get the pleasure of saying that, oh, my vote couldn't have changed anything anyways, it's not my fault. From this point on, you are often the only vote that counts. And this time you could argue ignorance. I mean, you didn't know what impact your choices would have, and you didn't even know that this really was a choice. You might have thought that if you refused to push the fake Reko, that Sarah was just gonna be like, no, I need to do it. But that was then, and this is now. The subgame is over, and your group of eight is now going to have to play the main game, and there will be no ambiguity over the consequences of your actions there. Chapter 2 Part 2, the second main game. One of the things I neglected to mention earlier is that the players have previously found four sheets of paper listing the names of 16 candidates alongside their occupation and a percentage. This was used in the first main game to identify that Alice was a murderer, since that was listed as his occupation. Some of the candidates listed are clearly people who died in their first trials, like Naomichi, Shunsuke, Anzu, Mai, Ranmaru, Megumi, Hinako, and Shin, while there are some participants' names that are conspicuously absent from the list, like Joe's, Nao's, So's, and Kugi's, Kana's older sister. The percentages are still a mystery for now, but I'm sure we'll figure them out later. Anyways, at this point, it's time for the main game. Almost. What happens next is that Gashu will distribute cards randomly to all surviving participants on their tablets, and they'll be given three hours to try and trade them around before the main game begins. A participant can enter any of the ring-up boxes, which is like phone boxes, that have sprung up around the facility and spend 50 tokens to forcefully trade cards with another participant. But everyone will receive a notification whenever a trade happens. Sarah is initially given a commoner card. But Keiji immediately forcefully trades it for the Keymaster to try and earn her trust, and to protect her. Another trade happens, but Sarah's unaffected by it. However, in the third trade, Sarah's Keymaster is stolen and replaced by the Sacrifice.
Sarah, in a panic, runs to find her wallet so she can trade it off to someone else. After all, if you earned more than 50 tokens in the previous section, you'd want to use them too, right? Well, good luck with that. Sarah's wallet, with all of her tokens, is now gone. She tries to do a little light grave robbing on the corpse of whichever Yabasame sibling you let die and or kill, depending on how you view the culpability of yourself in that outcome, but Southland has already cleaned up the body. You thought you'd get a choice in this? No. The other characters are making decisions too, and they're not going to give you an easy way out just because you're the main character. Someone deliberately stuck Sarah with the sacrifice, and the same card that killed Joe is going to kill her now. Her hallucinations reach a fever pitch, only to be broken by Gin, who comes in and reassures her. The other characters continue looking for a way out, and eventually, through a series of complicated plot events, discover a rule book detailing what happens if either a participant or a floor master breaks a rule as well as a map. And that map includes an exit. By the way, the rule is that like if a participant breaks the rule and fucks with the game somehow, they'll be executed, but the floor master just means that there's a 24 hour delay and then the game continues. Anyways, another trade happens, but Sarah's still stuck with her sacrifice card here. But that doesn't really matter if there's truly a way out now. The players find the stairway to the exit, the winner's staircase I guess, and rush up it through the winner's room and... Oh. Well, it was a good try. Unfortunately for the participants, there is a cave-in over the exit marked on the map, and unless someone pulls out a backhoe here, they're not getting through that before the main game is going to start. Everyone starts really sinking into despair around here. Their hope is gone, their defeat absolute. Sarah, in particular, has seemingly accepted her fate. She has no coins, and nobody else has an incentive to trade anymore since none of them have the sacrifice. And yet, at the last moment, one last trade does happen. Someone takes Sarah's sacrifice and hands her a commoner card right before everyone's knocked unconscious and they're sent to the banquet hall again. Last time, Sue Miley was the one that gave him their little pep talk, but this time, Gashu does it, although he is interrupted by Sue Miley halfway through, accusing him of interference with the game somehow. The participants then enter the main game, and after a brief delay from Kutaro, kick off once again. Now, there's a lot of deliberation that goes on here, particularly in terms of trying to figure out what happened with the trades. As Sarah, we know that the first trade was Keiji taking away our commoner card and giving us the Keymaster, and the third trade was someone taking away our Keymaster and giving us the Sacrifice, and the fifth trade was someone taking our Sacrifice and giving us a commoner. We don't know what the second or fourth trades are, or who else was involved in the third and fifth trades, and there is some disagreement about them. Through a convoluted discussion, which I won't bore you with if you've already played it, or which I won't spoil too much if you haven't, you discover that Kutaro was the one who'd had the Sacrifice card before you, and asserts that he's still Keymaster, and Sarah is still Sacrifice. Yeah, Kutaro did try and kill Sarah with that basically, effectively speaking anyways, but he missed that final trade so he doesn't know who has the sacrifice card anymore. To be clear, he thinks he knows, and Sarah is more than willing to let everyone believe him because that means that she won't get any votes and she won't become a finalist. And once she receives no votes, Kutaro realizes that she wasn't bluffing. <laughs> At this point, everyone kind of realized they'd been making a very stupid assumption about how the trades worked. All the participants had been operating under the assumption that you'd just trade your own card for somebody else's card if you made a trade, but the reality is that you were just paying to initiate a trade between any two players. And that's what actually happened in that first trade. KG wasn't the Keymaster, he didn't give his card to you, he was the Sage, and he stole the Keymaster from Kana to give to Sarah. And Kutaro revealed the existence of the Sacrifice card to So as part of a deal that they were doing as part of the narrative, and then it was So who traded Kutaro's Sacrifice card to Sarah in that third trade. 
Then, the fourth trade was Keiji trading his Sage for Kyutaro's Keymaster, meaning that Keiji is in the finals of the Keymaster and Kyutaro is not eligible, so he's safe to reveal that he is actually the Sage. Now, that just leaves the fifth trade. Nobody on the outside has revealed themselves to be the sacrifice yet, meaning that one of the finalists must be it. It can't be Keiji, because he's the key master, unless it's some real 60 chess, so it's either Kana, So, or Now. Kana was mentioned as having a lot of tokens, while Now had few, that's why she was up on that platform with you, which made it easier, likely, for Kana to make the trade. However, they point out that Now might have stolen Alice slash Reko's tokens after they died, meaning that she might have been able to afford another trade. And then, Kana claims that she did make the trade with Sarah because she could tell that she was clearly the sacrifice and wanted to make amends for letting her actual big sister die in their first trial. They also had the bear trap beds, and Kana ran away because Kugi told her to and smush. Anyways, she wanted to make amends for that by saving her new big sister, Sarah. However, something went wrong with the trade, and Kana still received a commoner card. So has also proven himself to be a talented hacker by this point. Again, there's some story stuff that I don't want to get into because I, I want to leave some mystery there. And it leads the participants to wonder if maybe he'd somehow hacked the tablets to fuck with them and either stolen the sacrifice card for himself in the trade or had rerouted it to someone else. And of course, all of this while well, nobody had an answer to a key question. What the fuck was Gashu's interference that Miley was mad about? They also circle back that list of names that I mentioned earlier. What did they mean? Why were there some names missing? There were 20 names on the blackboard in the bar, and 16 on that list, with So, Now, Joe, Kugi, and Kai all missing from the list but being present on the bar blackboard. However, there's also an anomaly here. Shinsukimi, listed at 0%, isn't on the blackboard, but he is on the sheet. So who the fuck is he? The participants start working through the names that they do know about. Kana vouches for Kugi being her real sister, and her real name, because obviously. Sarah vouches for Joe, again, obviously. Kai has been confirmed at this point through a laptop that the participants found to be Kai, and now was identified by name by Mishima while he was still alive. But nobody can confirm So, meaning that he must be Shin. Personally, I would argue that this may be some tenuous logic, but So goes along with it and reveals that he is in fact Shin. He reveals that the papers were from his first trial, saying that Sue Miley had explained to him that he had 0% chances of surviving the death game, and that it wasn't just speculation. They had run simulations with AIs of each of the candidates thousands of times to try and determine who was most likely to win, with Sarah being head and shoulders above the rest with a win rate of 15.5%, and So, or, or Shin, being at the very bottom with a 0.0% survival rate. So, he abandoned Shin and became So, a name that he pulled from his past. Surely that also won't be relevant later. He also mentions something curious. During that first trial with Sue Miley, the 16 people on the list were described as candidates. However, ever since then, he noted that the dolls have only ever referred to their group as participants. If you were paying attention up to this point, you might have also noticed me doing that same thing. This is because only the 16 people on that list were ever actually candidates to win. Joe, Kugi, Nao, and Kai were, for whatever reason, not actually eligible to win. They wouldn't have been allowed to, even though they were forced to play. And this leads Sarah to realize something. So couldn't have hacked the game without triggering his own death. The rule book was pretty clear about that, and I can't imagine they would protect him over that if he'd hacked it and swapped around cards without following the rules. And yet he wasn't dead. Why? Well, presumably it's because he didn't do it. And yet, if Kana was telling the truth, then there is someone they'd know who did fuck with the game. Gashu. Sarah realizes that Gashi realistically wouldn't rig the game to kill one candidate over another, since that would obviously tamper with it pretty dramatically, but he might just tamper with it to save a candidate by killing a participant, especially a participant who's connected to a candidate who is already gone. When Kana made the trade, Gashu interfered. Both Kana and Sarah are candidates, and he'd prefer a non-candidate take the sacrifice to keep the game competitive and avoid a non-candidate getting too far. And who's the only non-candidate left? Now. Sarah triumphantly presents her argument that Gashu interfered with the game, and invokes the rule that she found requiring the main game to be paused for 24 hours if a floor master interferes. Everyone's pretty excited to have gotten an extension to try and figure out what they're gonna do, see if they can get to that exit after all. But then, Gashu interrupts them. Sarah didn't read the whole passage. The 24 hour delay is only one of two potential resolutions for his interference. The other is the death of the floor master, and in order to keep the main game rolling, he immediately pulls out a revolver and shoots himself in the head. Safalin takes over as the host, and the main game continues. See, this is part of why Your Turn to Die's approach to choice is so fun. 
It showed you the ropes. It showed you how difficult it can be to make a choice now that you're the de facto leader. And then it reminded you that leading the participants doesn't mean anything compared to the people leading the game. You get to make choices, but only on their terms, not yours. You are not the boss of the death game. The rules of the game exist exclusively to bind you and the other candidates to play the game correctly and to stop the overseers from rigging it too much. But it does not protect the non-candidates at all. It doesn't really protect the candidates either, it just keeps them honest. And this crushes some of the hope that you had. Because remember, in that very first practice run that you had, where Mishima died, you thought you'd been learning the lesson that you can find a loophole in the rules. There's a way to get out of here. You can save everyone, or maybe not everyone, but more people. You don't have to have a death. And the people running the game want you to know that, yeah, that's true, but only if they want someone to survive. If they want someone to die, which they very much so do with the main game, you're gonna have to kill someone. And speaking of, now you have a choice to make. There are eight participants left. Now has the sacrifice and Keiji is the key master, leaving So and Kana as the only options really on the table here. So and Kana both beg the participants to kill them and save the other person, and both of their arguments are kind of persuasive in their own ways. So persuasive, in fact, that it is a 3-3 split between them, with Now using both of her votes on herself. So we're at 3-3-2. Sarah, then, is forced to break the tie to kill either So or Kana. Their blood is firmly on her hands. There's no way to get around that. She has to be the tiebreaker here. But then now pipes up to remind Sarah that in the event of a tie, the sacrifice wins the vote, and offers to save Sarah if she casts her vote for now instead. So, what do you choose? The game is listening to your response here. You aren't in control of the game itself, but you're in control of this singular decision. And it fucking sucks. Like, ask anyone who played this. This is brutal. Up until now, you either didn't really have a say in who died, or you didn't know you did when you did. But this time, it is unambiguous. You are either killing Kana to save So, killing So to save Kana, or killing everyone except for now to save yourself. The game will accept any of those three responses from you. So what'll it be? Well, you can vote for now, and if you do so, you get the massacre ending. <laughs> Shock of all shocks, this is not a good end. Everyone else is executed one by one, with Sarah just blocking it all out. Now comforts her, thanking her for saving her, and promising to always be with her. Kind of incidentally, if you get this route, Sarah is actually the true winner of the death game, since now isn't a candidate. This is the first proper ending of the game, and the second way for the death game to end with a winner so far, the first being Kutaro getting the exit ticket during the trust barter. However, realistically, this isn't the end of the game. You're not really supposed to just go with now and end it there. The real choice is between So and Kana. One of them will die based on your vote, and you need to choose. Regardless of which one you pick, Now is going to be executed by a metal belt that's wrapped around her waist that crushes her to death, and Sarah will again be given a button, this time by Safflin, but instead of delaying her death, it's an instant death button that allows you to instantly end her suffering, the reverse of what happened with Joe. If you try to push it though, you'll discover that it's still a false choice. I mean, you might try to push it, but now we'll plead for her life, and Sarah will never go through with pushing it. Regardless, Now's death is slow and agonizing, and brutal no matter what you do. There isn't anything to distract you, it's just now slowly being crushed to death. Silver lining though, you do get a scene of her post-death with Mishima where she paints his portrait in the afterlife. And if Reko died, she'll also be there. If Alice died, I guess, I don't know, he's in hell, maybe? Who knows? I mean, he's a murderer, allegedly. <laughs> now, at this point, who'd you pick? Kana or So? <laughs> If 
If you voted for Kana, so is fucking livid with you. He wanted Sarah to choose emotion over logic to save her, and while so might be the logical choice here, he was the wrong one in his own eyes. Kana, remember the elementary school student who's been wearing a bucket on her head this whole time, accepts her death. Realistically, she'd accepted it when she tried to take Sarah's sacrifice card, and she's executed via the human flower. The seeds are injected into her neck from her collar and spread quickly through the whole body, numbing her a little bit before blooming and killing her. It is pretty fucking rough. So, in his rage, programs a Joe AI that he'd found somewhere to become hostile and pick a fight with Sarah to try and cause as much drama as possible as revenge. And Sarah snaps. Instead of her hallucinations, she simply forgets Joe's existence, something that's going to have some consequences in the not-so-distant future. If you picked So, he is grateful that you made the right choice, and Kana ends up being pretty okay with it too. <laughs> Kana lives, and so thinks he can escape. And to be fair to him, he does actually somehow manage to get out of his collar. He makes it out of the room as he's attacked by the facility's defense systems, promising to rebut Sarah's reasoning with his final act. Chases after him to find him in a computer room that they'd found earlier on the third floor, the rubble room, slumped over the keyboard dead. He'd used his last moments to activate a friendly Joe AI that talks her through it, comforts her, and helps her move past her trauma.
she still remembers him now, but she's at peace with what happened. Regardless of which route you picked, you're now free of your hallucinations and are living with the consequences of the combination of choices you've made in this chapter. Throughout chapter 2, the narrative branched twice, once with the decision between Reko and Alice, and once with the decision between So and Kana. At this point, you're entering one of four routes, the Reko So route, the Reko Kana route, the Alice So route, or the Alice Kana route. And if you're curious, I was a bit of a heartless monster here, so I ended up on the Reko So route. And there was at least one person who commented on like the VOD of this stream who said I've never seen anyone pick Kana that quickly, which... It was a moment of self-inspection, and if you've played the game, you're likely thinking that I got what I deserved in the next chapter. If you haven't, well, let's see what happens to Sarah next. Chapter 3 Part 1 The Subgame Like I mentioned earlier, Chapter 3 Part 1 is split up into Part 1A and Part 1B to cover the subgame. When I wrote and recorded this script, though, my brain was very dumb and made a pretty big mistake about where the break between those two parts happened. I wrongly thought that the split happened at the beginning of the banquet, because to me, that's really the midpoint of the section, and I just assumed that that would be where the split was. However, it actually happened significantly earlier because Part 1A is much shorter than I remembered. So, while the next two sections of the video are titled Part 1A and Part 1B, they don't really properly align with the actual Parts 1A and B from the game. For our purposes, Chapter 3 Part 1A is going to cover the entirety of the Murderer game, right up until the point where the characters enter the gate on Floor 4 to begin the banquet, and Chapter 3 Part 1B is going to cover everything from that point until the end of Chapter 3 Part 1. If you've played through Part 1A but not 1B, I would suggest doing that before watching any further if you want to avoid any spoilers. However, I'm assuming that if you've gotten this far, you're kind of in for a penny and for a pound, so let's get into it. Chapter 3 Part 1A The Murderer Game so, like I said, Chapter 3 begins with Sarah in one of two states, either healed, blessed, and flourishing, or very visibly mentally unwell. Safflin rushes everyone up to the fourth floor to their next subgame where they're greeted by their new floor master, So Hiyori, the real one this time that Alice Yabasame killed, not the one you've been calling So this whole time. Right, I didn't mention it earlier, but the person that Alice had killed that sent him to prison was So. Like I said, I'm going to try and spoil as little as possible if you haven't already played the game so that you can go and still enjoy it. You have the choice to click away at any point. Anyways, unfortunately, I do have to spoil that now because the real So is here. Or at least the doll form of him. He asks you to actually pick a new name for him since Shin stole his and plans to keep using it, and while you can type anything, the default is Midori. So going forward, we're going to refer to the green-haired guy that we've been playing with as So, and the floor master as Midori. Anyways, he introduces the first part of this floor's subgame. The coffins around him crack open, and dolls of several of the candidates who died in the first trial emerge. Midori pairs up each doll, or as he calls them, the dummies, with the surviving candidates. Sarah's paired up with Renmaru, Keiji gets Hinako, Kyutaro gets Mei, and Gin gets Hayasaka. Anzu will go with either Alice or Reko, depending on who survived, and Kuramata will go with either So or Kana, again, depending on who survived. The dummies have to stay close to their candidates or they'll be killed. And remember, just like with the fake Reko, they are functionally indistinguishable from real human beings in terms of their ability to perceive their own existence. They know they're dolls, they know that their real selves died already, but they still want to live. Anyways, with that, the subgame truly begins. It's time for the murderer game. The pairs have to try and hunt down and kill Midori himself, who immediately flees. As the group tries to follow him, they're blocked by an obstructor, and that's actually going to bring us to a new element of choice that we haven't talked about too much so far. Namely, why it's so fucking difficult to put into a game. See, part of why games tend to not really do this, not go down this route, is because it is insanely complicated from a development standpoint. When games offer branching narratives, there's often a true ending in there somewhere. 
like the other routes in a game like Zero Escape exist to flesh out characters, explore more possibilities, or just gather information for getting the true ending. However, having branching paths that are running parallel to each other and are equally viable narratives means that you're now writing multiple full stories with different characters that still have to go through roughly similar narrative beats. You know, Danganronpa isn't going to allow you to kill whoever you want because that would make it impossible to write for, and your turn to die isn't any different. There's a reason the end of the game still isn't out yet, and it's because every time you split your narrative, you double your workload again. To put the timeline of the development of this game into context, it took five months for Chapter 1 Part 2 to come out after the game initially dropped in August of 2017, and a little over six more months for Chapter 2 Part 1. Those were the sections of the game where Nankai didn't have to worry about branching paths, with Chapter 2 Part 1 ending with the death of either Rekko or Alice. However, Chapter 2 Part 2 took 9 months to release, the longest so far, and then Chapter 3 Part 1 was further split into Part 1A and Part 1B, with Part 1A taking another 9 months and Part 1B taking another 13 after that, and that one came out in May of 2021. As of the time of writing this in June 2024, 37 months later, Chapter 3 Part 2, the final main game of Your Turn to Die, still hasn't been released. Why? Well, presumably because this shit is insane. Instead of writing one story, Nankai had to write one story that turned into two stories that turned into at least four stories as of the beginning of chapter three. There are four different roster makeups as of the start of this chapter, and who knows how many there are going to be by the end of the chapter. How do you write that in such a way that all those rosters and all those routes still work and still hit? And that's especially true now because he's gone back and added in a bunch of new characters, all of whom were previously just names. The in-universe explanation is that they needed to use dolls of people who had zero connection to the survivors, meaning that people like Kugi or Mishima were both out. And they were forced to introduce six effectively new characters to the audience. I say effectively new characters because you likely have seen at least some of their victim videos by this point, so you might have seen the designs before. So far I've primarily talked about choice as a narrative tool for the audience, but it's also important to recognize it as a logistical obstacle. There's a reason why game devs don't usually do this shit. It's incredibly difficult, even for a full team, and Your Turn to Die is a one-man show. There can't be a true route, there can't be one of these that's prioritized or objectively better than the others because that would undermine the importance of Sarah's choices. All routes have to be equally weighted and equally valued narratively or else it weakens the impact of choosing Rekko or Alice or choosing So or Kana, making it pretty obvious why the release schedule has become dramatically stretched out. That's all especially true because this is the ending that we're talking about. Not only do you need to write satisfying branching narratives, but you need to be able to write conclusions to all of them, and that's just inherently going to be very difficult. Getting back to the game, all of this is related to why you're fighting the obstructor here. See, Nankai just introduced six new characters, but he's also absolutely not going to let you hold on to them easily. Throughout the murderer game, you'll face a handful of these sort of fights, and failure in any of them will result in one of your dummies dying prematurely and the game having to work around that. For example, in this first one, Anzu dies if you fail. That means that the entire rest of the chapter needs to be written to accommodate Schrodinger's Anzu, who both died and survived the Obstructor. There are ways for nearly all the dummies to die like this, with a couple notable exceptions that we'll get to later. Throughout this process, you'll learn about some more trials that happened on this floor, including Alice's. He was in the 6th floor locker room with a partner in the 5th floor locker room. However, he didn't really give a shit about the trial and was a little bit confused by the whole thing, he's kinda dumb, and he just immediately left the room, killing his partner without his knowledge. Whoops. You also learn that the organization behind it all, Asunaro, has somehow caused them to lose memories, which they're able to get back with a special lamp and Sarah's help. Between this and the Creamy Tojo stuff, it feels like a little bit of a reference to V3, but I'll get past that. You can choose not to investigate everyone's memories, or investigate only some of them, but if you do, you'll learn more about why everyone ended up here. Namely, everyone seemed to have signed some sort of consent form. They also discover that they had all previously interacted with Midori somewhere along the line, and that he was the one who was putting the consent form in front of them. They agreed to devote their lives to Asunaro in exchange for granting a wish, and presumably that's why they're all in the death game. They also discover that the dummies aren't really there to be their allies. Their objective is to kill their human partners before we get to the end game, and Mai is the first to make a move by stabbing Kutaro. But it's okay, he's fine. Everyone reconciles and they move on remarkably quickly from that, actually. As well, they discover that the reason for the non-candidates being part of the death game was to try and balance the odds a bit more. 
in general, this was presented as wanting to give someone an ally. Like, Kana's a little kid. Of course she needs someone to help her out a bit. However, they're not always a help. Sometimes they're deliberately meant to be a hindrance. For example, without Joe, Sarah was a ruthless competitor by all accounts. I mean, that's why she had the highest win rate by far. She can manipulate the other players like no other, but Joe's presence in the game subdues and disrupts her enough that it gives the others a bit of a chance. Kai, meanwhile, was just added as a punishment for trying to protect Sarah from being added to the game. Now was there for Mishima, and Kugi was ostensibly there to help Kana, but my personal theory is that she was actually there just that her death would traumatize Kana and force her to bond with Sarah so she could bring her down even more. But that's just a theory. Anyways, at this point, your choices are relatively limited. It's more about how you manage to either save or damn the various dummies and how you engage with them. This is a lot more about like building out the narrative, like figuring out more about the people, figuring out where they came from, what they were up to, all that good stuff. There are, however, a few important moments for our purposes before we get to the final game. For one, remember how I just said that Joe was a bit of a limiter for Sarah? I mean, I hope you would. It was like 30 seconds ago max. Well, if you saved Kana, she still remembers Joe and he still serves that function for her. But if you saved So, then she forgot him. And now the ruthlessness is starting to come back a little bit. Her partner, Ranmaru, offers to try and kill off the rest of the team so that the two of them can be the sole survivors and walk out together. Because as it turns out, those are the win conditions. If two people make it to the end with nobody winning outright, one of the final two humans has to volunteer to become a doll for them both to leave. But if there's a doll and a human, they both get to go. And for just a moment, Sarah's on board with this plan. She changes her mind pretty quickly on this, but it's not quick enough. And sooner rather than later, you're gonna find Alice or Reko killed in Alice's first trial room. Maru deliberately activated the trap to kill them, and now, whoops, you're down another candidate. Crucially, if you saved Kana, the surviving Yabasame doesn't die here. It's another branch in the narrative. Aside from whichever combination of dummies are alive at this point, you now either have Alice and Kana, Reko and Kana, or just so as part of your party. Not only has the makeup of the roster of humans changed, but the quantity as well. Either 5 if you pick So, or 6 if you pick Kana, and that has pretty massive implications given that half the participants in a main game will advance to the second round, and Asunaro rounds down. If they go to the main game like this, the second round wouldn't have the same number of people between both runs. And remember, I only said that the quantity of the humans might have changed. 5 or 6. There's any number of dummies that could be dead at this point too. I don't know how none could I manage to make it through this. I would be going insane. I'm go I went insane trying to read the transcript for this. Anyways, as you proceed, you discover that Sarah was a bit of an outlier here. She never signed the Asanaro vow, and Midori is desperate to make her do so. Eventually she does, and she holds on to her wish, but that's not really important here, because all of that begs the question, why was Sarah in the death game to begin with? Everyone else signed their lives away for a wish, Midori makes that explicit, that's the whole point of the consent form, but Sarah was in it without signing that consent form. Midori suggests that it's possible someone else wished for her to be entered in the game. 
But given that Midori loves fucking with people, it's also entirely possible that this is just total nonsense. I mean, who knows? Maybe Sarah's the only human being tested against a team of dolls. Or maybe she's secretly a doll trying to pass as a human and she doesn't even know. Or maybe this is just one of the simulations. Or maybe a dog did it. By the way, if you want my personal bet on like a weird twist ending, my money's on the killing game being a test of whether or not Asunaro's dolls are good enough to pass as human. And if I had to say, I think Sarah's the doll they're testing in the game. But realistically, they're probably all humans. I just want that out there that I might be able to predict that. Regardless of what choices you make here, which to be fair, not many aside from optional backstory stuff and trying to keep dummies alive, you'll eventually discover that you need to put seven people, dead or alive, human or dummy, into a set of coffins. In fact, those same coffins that the dummies came out of before. For some complicated story reasons, you don't really know where Keiji's at right now. Earlier in the chapter, he picked a fight with Midori and lost because it turns out that Keiji had shot the cop that he idolized because Midori tricked him into doing it, and then his supervisor covered for him, and so that's why he let her die in the first trial. That's Megumi, by the way. Uh, and also why he tried to go kill Midori. It, it, there's a lot happening in this story. Like, I promise, I am oversimplifying like fucking crazy here. But anyways, he gets locked in one of the coffins, and Midori tells Sarah that the only way that she can get him out is to sign the Asanaro vow and use her wish on it. She does initially go to do that, but Renmaro stops her and they try to get Keiji out of there some other way. Unbeknownst to Sarah, but known to you, the player, Sarah did succeed at getting him out of the coffin at one point and he went on a bit of an adventure of his own for a while. Although where he ended up is still a mystery to everyone. Midori himself seems a bit confused about the whole thing, but he assumes Keiji is still in the coffin, so that's what everyone rolls with. And so the coffins are filled, and we move on to... Chapter 3, Part 1b, The Banquet. So, the seven in the coffins right now are the dummies. Ranmaru, Hinako, Kurumada, Mai, Shunsuke, and Anzu, plus Keiji. The remaining survivors, Sarah, Kitaro, Gen, and either So or Kana plus either Alice or Reko, are all brought into the banquet, the finale of the murderer game. They are told to select one member of their own team to be their champion against Midori, and Gin volunteers himself. You start feeling like everyone's saving him, he wants to try and save them for once, which... The whole game is about them saving him, but whatever, anyways, moving on. He and Midori are locked into the final two coffins, which are attached to a rotating platform. This is effectively another Russian roulette, with Meister here to officiate once again. coffins themselves are soundproofed and seemingly impossible to distinguish from one another, and both teams are going to be taking turns choosing one coffin or another. When the coffin is activated, a drill is going to run through that coffin from the bottom, killing whoever was inside. I mean, assuming they're still alive to begin with, I saved everyone, so I <laughs> had to kill them all here. The goal is to kill Midori before he can kill Gin, and both teams get some hints and other tips to try and figure out who's who. Now, what makes this section insanely complicated from a storytelling perspective, and part of the reason why I have just a shitload of respect for Nankadai for managing to do this, is that you have an absolutely absurd level of possible rosters at this point to interact with.
The only dummy that you couldn't have gotten killed by this point is Hinako, but Ranmaru, Kuramata, Mai, Shensuke, and Anzu are a litter of Schrodinger's cats for Nankadai. The story has to be written as if they are both dead and alive, meaning that dialogue should be written for them, but only in a way that other characters can substitute in to ensure that essential information is communicated. You might remember that we also played Russian Roulette earlier in Chapter 1 Part 1, but the difference back then is that if you fucked up you could just get your game over and restart the game. can't do that for the banquet for a few reasons. I mean, for one, it would kill all the tension, so for this section, it's all sleight of hand when it comes to the choices you can make. It's impossible to totally fuck it up and accidentally kill Gin at the start because the characters aren't really connected to the numbered coffins. Instead, your turn to die does something really clever and uses this as a way to kill off the dummies in a way that builds tension and feels like you have control and is appropriately crushing when you kill them all, when in reality it's almost entirely on rails. Whenever you use a hint, that locks in that coffin's inhabitant whether alive or dead. The first time you use a hint, you're given the choice between two coffins, and whichever one you hit will be Shunsuke. Whichever you didn't will be Kuramata. Next time you use a hint, whichever coffin you use it on will become Mai's. You can choose between either killing Shunsuke or Kuramata in your first choice, or killing Mai and the survivor of your first choice in the second round. And whichever one you don't kill will make it to the end. And then they'll die anyways because their battery's gonna run out. Renmaru and Anzu, meanwhile, are doomed no matter what. They're both gonna be selected by Midori, and we'll get to that in a sec. Part of why Nankai does this is that it's meant to be a pretty big moment in the game. Like, this is the end of the murderer game. There's a lot going on here. And if they allowed you to have a genuinely 1 in 9 shot of immediately winning or immediately losing, it'd kind of kill that. On top of that, realistically speaking, people will just look up guides online that tell them which coffin Midori is in so they can drill them and save the others. The key difference between this and the Russian Roulette minigame was that the minigame was built to have a perfect solution. You were allowed to load in the bullets however you chose, and if you were smart, there was a pattern to load them in to guarantee that you could save everyone. The banquet is different because it's PvP instead of PvE. It's you and the other candidates versus Midori, with Meister officiating just like he did in the original Russian Roulette. Anyways, back to some murder gaming, we've discussed how Shensuke, Kuramata, Mai, Ranmaru, and Anzu all come up during the banquet. What about Hinako? Well, for one, that's not Hinako. Not the real one, anyway. I mean, we know it's not the real one that was supposed to be. It's not the doll of Hinako. It's not Hinako in any sense. See, the real Hinako was the person that Alice killed in his first trial, and you were told that this was a doll of her just like the rest of the dummies. But that wasn't true. The original Hinako, who did exist, had black hair, and the one that you've been hanging out with has pink hair. She was actually an agent of Asunaru the whole time, who was meant to work alongside Midori and, along with him, had rigged the game a bit. However, Midori also betrays her and kills her throughout this, so rip to the unnamed Asunaru agent, I guess. I, sorry, I feel like I'm jumping around the order of things, so let's just, like, get that nailed down here. Sarah moves first, and ends up killing either Shunsuke or Kuramata. Up until this point, the story has to be written with the assumption that all dummies might be alive or dead, which makes this understandably convoluted as hell. And this includes up to the moment of their death. If they are still alive, you're going to get a real sad message from them right before they get killed. My best guess for how Nankadai managed to pull this off is that he first wrote the whole segment in the Kana route with either Alice or Reko substituting for one another and all the dummies alive, and then just worked backwards by substituting out anything a dummy says with a fallback option in case they're dead. Then he did the same for the So route with So substituting for Kana and various other characters substituting for Alice or Reko. It's not one to one, like it's not like So says everything that Kana would have said, sometimes a different character will take it, but in general, that's I'm guessing where he started from at least. And again, props him for not going completely insane trying to keep all that straight, because I genuinely don't think I could do that. You can find the transcript for this on the Your Turn to Die wiki, and it is incredible how much work had to go into making fallback plans here. Anyways, then it's Midori's turn, and he uses a hint to reveal a human. He activates that coffin, and surprise to everyone, it's Hinako.
she's shocked at being betrayed for the half second before she gets obliterated, and now everyone's even more confused over this discovery that Hanako was a secret agent all along. Then, it's Sarah's turn, and she'll either kill Mai or the survivor from her first choice. Whoever of those three she didn't pick is going to make it to the end. Next, it's Midori's turn, and he identifies another glowing coffin with a human in it. And this has to begin. The only other human coffins were Hinako's, which is gone, and the one that Keiji's body must be in, which isn't glowing for complicated reasons involving paint that deactivates with heat. Before Midori can select the coffin, though, Sarah uses her Asanaro vow to wish him to pick a different coffin, which Meister bizarrely allows to happen. Presumably he's a little bit pissed at Midori for like allowing her to get that far with the wish and she wasn't supposed to, so fuck him, it's part of the rules. Angrily, Midori swaps to Anzu, killing her instead. Out of the nine original coffins, you're left with five. Gin, Midori, Keiji's corpse, Ranmaru, and whichever dummy Sarah hasn't killed. Two of the coffins are glowing, meaning that they haven't had their paint wiped off, and three don't glow. They discover that Midori was originally in one of the glowing ones, but swapped last minute with Hinako, meaning that he's in one of the non-glowing ones along with Keiji's corpse and Ranmaru. You use another hint, and it reveals a human. Presumably Keiji, so you're left with a 50-50 between Ranmaru and Midori in the other two. And... You hit Ranmaru. R.I.P. Coconut Head. And now Midori knows Gin's coffin. It's over. Except it isn't. Kyutaro reveals that he, Mai, and Keiji cooked up some sort of plan that's finally coming to fruition. Midori reveals that he thought that Keiji's plan was to use Midori's collar from the control room to trick the machines, because the hint system that they're using uses the collars to identify whether someone's a human or a dummy. But it turns out, he was wrong. He drilled one of the human coffins only to hit Keiji's corpse. Or so they thought, because then in walks Keiji himself. Midori realizes that Keiji used Mishima's collar from the first floor to identify a coffin as human, and says he cheated and therefore must be executed. Regardless, Sarah then picks Midori's coffin.
he's killed, and then Meister says that they need to kill the rule breaker, only for Kutaro to say that there's no need. Now, if you thought this shit was convoluted before, I promise you, you didn't know the half of it. See, originally Keiji did do what Midori thought he did. He went and dropped Midori's collar in the coffin after escaping before going on his little adventure. But it turns out that Mai's attack on Kutaro, remember when she knifed him in the back, was way more deadly than he'd initially let on. Those two went back to the cemetery, took out Midori's collar from Keiji's grave, and Kutaro put himself in it to die. But we've had a Kutaro with us the whole time, haven't we? Well, yes and no. From there, he instructed Mai to go to Safalin and activate a Kutaro doll, and use the machine that they found on the fifth floor to put the Kutaro AI in it. Thus, the real Kutaro was dead. That's who was in that coffin that we thought had Keiji's corpse, and the doll in front of them dies shortly after. as does the dummy you saved, because they've now both run out of battery. This is, in my opinion, one of the most, if not the most, successful attempts to create the illusion of choice that I've ever experienced in a game. While part 1a reveals how difficult it can be to write a narrative that involves choice, part 1b is honestly a masterclass in resolving loose threads in a way that still really works. You feel like you're being given choices, and it sucks. None of these choices are fun. Killing your friends back to back to back like that? Not ideal. Even if maybe they were not really humans, and even if maybe they were initially supposed to try and kill you, and even if one of them maybe did kill someone. But with all that said, this segment is functionally entirely on rails, with the exception of which of the three dummies you save. But even then, they still die anyways. More importantly though, I would argue that the narrative purpose of Part 1b is to remind the player that they aren't the only one making choices. That you really don't have to take on the weight of the world alone just because you've kind of become the leader here. Keiji and Kutaro are once again making choices of their own rather than just passively existing in Sarah's story. And alongside Ranmaru's choice to kill either Reko or Alice, if you saved so, it all culminates brilliantly in this banquet. The dummies are doomed by the narrative like no other. They were already killed once, so of course they're going to be killed again. Realistically, none of them are making it through. But the game still makes it hurt every time, and it makes it feel like you really just need to get your guesses right. Maybe you can save some of them. Maybe you'll get lucky on the 50-50 between Ranmaru and Midori, and it'll all work out. But you can't. However, part of it I would argue is also that it becomes about how difficult life is when everyone has the power to choose. Keiji and Kutaro both made things so much more complicated than it was supposed to be, and neither could really explain it to you because it'd give the whole thing away. Did it help you eventually win? Yeah, but only just barely, and only because you made a choice that made it work in the end. You're the one who was forced to push the button and bear the burden of the consequences even though you were operating on incomplete information. Even Sarah's ability to choose sometimes overrides the players here, such as her choice to use the Asanaro vow to block Midori from hitting Gin. And that's before getting into Midori himself, who repeatedly rigged the game with both Hinako and his own fuckery with the paint. Speaking of Midori, this part also provides kind of an interesting expansion on the finale of Chapter 2 in Gashu's Suicide. Like, that part felt like a reminder that the Game Masters are ultimately in control of the game, not the players, but that if they fuck up, they can still suffer the consequences. And Chapter 3 Part 1 also reveals that being a Game Master really isn't the same thing as immunity, even if they're playing effectively by the rules. The other Floor Masters don't put themselves on the line. Tia Safflin didn't do that. Sue Miley didn't do that. Real Ranger accidentally did that. He got shot in the head by Gashu. I didn't really mention that earlier, sorry. But he didn't put himself on the line with the players. He didn't enter into the game itself in that way. But Gashu and Midori both did. Gashu because he wanted it to stay between the candidates because he was worried that the participants were getting in the way of things. But Midori does it because he can't help himself. He decides to make himself an active participant in the game itself, not just fuck up as the referee. And it bites him in the ass when he's forced to abide by the rules of the game. The weak can't choose to make the powerful vulnerable, but the powerful can choose to make themselves vulnerable. And they might just do it for the same reason Midori does. He thinks he's too powerful, he's too smart, he's too ahead of everyone else to lose. And up until this point he kinda has been. 
He managed to get everyone to sign that fucking vow, and they didn't realize what they were getting into. But he forgot that he had given Sarah the ability to make that wish. He'd forgotten that she hadn't used it, and no aspect of the game was built to accommodate anyone not having used their wish yet. Everyone else signed the vow long before the game and presumably made their wish at the same time. But Sarah didn't, introducing an unexpected gameplay mechanic that Midori wouldn't have been vulnerable to if he hadn't gotten overconfident, or if he hadn't fixated so heavily on getting Sarah to sign it. Choice is essential in Your Turn to Die, and Chapter 3 Part 1 is really about living with the consequences of your choices. Sarah's choice in the second main game leads to the death of the surviving Yabasame. Mai's choice to stab Kutaro leads to his death and the defeat of Midori. Kutaro's choice to take Keiji's place to try and help his friends leads to a whole lot of confusion and very nearly Gin's death. Gin's choice to become the champion of the candidates in the banquet in order to protect his friends leads to Sarah having to step in to burn her wish and protect him once again. Hinako's decision to try and protect herself by wiping away her glowing paint with hot chocolate and then swapping with Midori leads to her getting killed anyways. Midori's decision to offer Sarah the Asanaro vow because he desperately wanted to get her to sign it leads to his own death, and so many more choices like that. Not everyone's making choices in Chapter 3 Part 1, there are some people who are a little bit more passive throughout all of it, but everyone who's making choices has to live with the choices they've made if they're lucky enough to live at all. And whether or not they are, they're still gonna force everyone else to live with them. And now it's time for the final main game. Sarah, Gin, and Keiji are guaranteed participants alongside So if you saved him, or Kana plus whatever Yabasame you saved. As far as we know, the rules will be the same. There'll be one key master, one sacrifice, and one sage, with the remaining players as commoners. Regardless of which route you went down, at least two people need to die. Either the sacrifice and the person who loses the majority vote, or everyone except the sacrifice and whoever they chose to save. And in the so route, both of those result in the same number of casualties. So, what happens next? Chapter 3 Part 2 The Final Main Game At this point, well, we don't really know. It's been more than three years since the last update to the story, presumably because this is an insanely complicated narrative to resolve just in terms of making sure that all the different timelines that have been created can reach a satisfying conclusion. And if this video is the only thing you know about the game, then congrats, I promise you it is so much more complicated than I've made it seem. Like, believe it or not, I'm assuming that we're at least an hour, hour and something into this at this point, this is still the simplified version of the story. There's Kai's whole deal with like emails and a laptop and all that stuff, there's a subplot with Kana and a phone that you find with a message to her from her dead sister that keeps changing, there's the Mishima AI in chapter 2, there's, there's so much going on, so much more that I couldn't touch on because it just didn't really connect to our topic of choice and this is already going to be a stupid long video. And also, I didn't want to touch on it because I still want to leave room for people to go play the game themselves. I mean, if you haven't played it already, this one did spoil it a fair bit, a lot more than the Buried Stars video did, but I assure you that if you picked up this game right now after watching this video for the first time, you'd still have plenty to be confused by. Besides, maybe you'll make better choices than me. Or maybe you'll make worse ones. I never got Kyutaro to kill everyone in Chapter 2, but maybe you can manage it. I also never lost any of the attractions because I happen to be a pro gamer, but maybe you'll struggle with it a bit more than I did, I don't know. Or maybe you'll just make different choices. One of the fun things about this game is seeing how people disagree about what was the right choice. Is it better to save Alice or Reko? Who deserved to live more? Do you go back and change it? When you go to the menu, when you go to the chapter select, you can always choose to change what you chose. But most people just don't. Unless they're trying to see all of the routes and get some completion information. But like, overwhelmingly, if you pick to save Reko, you're sticking with Reko because that's your story, that's your choice. You have to live with it. And at the end of the day, I wanted to use this video to talk about choice. Your Turn to Die makes not only the moments where you get to choose feel impactful, but also the moments where it robs you of your ability to choose. More than I would argue any other game in its genre, I think it really succeeds by allowing Sarah to be a leader and make a lot of the choices, but not just leaving everything up to her. Sarah gets to decide the fate of Alice and Reko in Chapter 2 Part 1, and then gets to decide not only the fate of So and Kana in Chapter 2 Part 2, but also the fate of the surviving Yabasame sibling as a result. Sometimes characters get mad at Sarah for things that are entirely within her control, like So getting mad at her if she kills Kana, but often they're mad at her for things that she had nothing to do with, that she couldn't have changed. In that way, which I think is a smaller way, but still it's important, it's also a game about leadership and the burdens that it places on someone. Sarah gets shuffled into the leadership role pretty early on, even if it's just unofficial, but she keeps it throughout the game and it results in pretty unique struggles that she has to face. The failure to save Joe feels like a failure on her part rather than something that was simply out of their hands because there was no way for her to save him. 
His presence in the game made it impossible for her to play the kind of cutthroat game that she would have without him. And somewhat ironically, the version of her that didn't have Joe probably would have figured out what Joe was trying to do and gone along with him. However, as she learns later, he wouldn't have been in that game if it wasn't for her. He is there exclusively to fuck up Sarah's run. And so of course she bears the burden of that. Now's death is a little bit different, it doesn't really feel like it's her fault because it was just straight up Gashu's interference that caused it, but the deaths of the Yabasames as well as either So or Kana are really on her, and she is immensely affected by them. She's the one who was given the gun in that first Russian roulette game, and she was the one who had to similarly pull the trigger in the banquet. Even if she realistically wouldn't have acted any differently than any of the others, and she broadly acted only when there was consensus, it doesn't change that she was the one who had to push the button. Making choices is hard. Being in charge is hard. Other games have tried to grapple with this, but I think Your Turn to Die manages to rise above them all by legitimately incorporating player choice into the narrative. With a lot of these killing games, there is a choice within the narrative, but not for the player. You know, the protagonists of the Danganronpa games usually struggle with this stuff to some degree, but they also get the comfort of knowing they didn't really have a choice. As much as it sucks to execute your friend, someone did choose to kill someone, and the alternative is letting a murderer go free and killing a room full of innocents. In Your Turn to Die, none of the participants die because they did something wrong. Kugi, Megumi, Ranmaru, Shunsuke, Anzu, Hinako, Kurumada, Mai, Mishima, Joe, Kai, Alice, Reko, Nao, Kana, So, and Kutaro all die, either in every timeline or at least in some, because of circumstances beyond their control. And it's not like they were guaranteed to die. The AI simulations showed Kurumada having the second best odds of winning behind Sarah, only for him to die in the first trial before even meeting the others. I mean, so was kind of guaranteed to die as Shin, but who knows what's happened to him now that he's seen those odds. Maybe he does have a chance of winning if he has that information. The only three guaranteed to survive up to this point are Sarah, Keiji, and Gin, who were first, third, and 14th ranked in that list that we got earlier. And all of this still begs the question of, what are they even doing in the death game? Why are they doing this? Who is Asunaro? How did they end up in the death game? When did this happen? Where is it happening? What the fuck is going on? They're closer to a victor, but are they closer to answers? Something Midori mentions to Sarah really stands out that I talked about earlier. Everyone else is in the death game because of the Asanaro vow, which signs over your life in exchange for granting your wish. The other candidates, for one reason or another, did choose to sign it. So even though they didn't know that it signed them up for a death game, they still did make that choice, similar to how you made the choice to save either Alice or Reko, even though you didn't know you did. But Sarah didn't. According to Midori, Sarah is seemingly in the death game because someone else used their wish to put her in it. Is that true? Who knows? Midori is a freak and a liar who might just be trying to fuck with her for no good reason other than that he enjoys it. But on the other hand, it seems like it must be true that Sarah didn't initially sign the contract. Otherwise, there's no way that Midori would have allowed her to have a second wish for no real gain. And Midori explicitly says that the purpose of the contract is just to get people locked into the death game. So then, who wished for Sarah to enter the game? And what happened to her parents? Like, her mom was passed out in her house for whatever reason, we have no idea what's going on with her, but we have seen a little bit about her father in some flashbacks with Kai, and depending on what routes you go down, it seems like her father might actually be involved with Asunaru. If you saved Kana, you meet with her father in the winner's room. Or maybe you don't. Maybe it's just another hallucination. But if it isn't, what the fuck does that mean for Sarah? Ultimately, it's an unfinished story. And all we can do is wait and see what Nankadai chooses to do with it. And I've got to say, I do not envy him. Whatever choices he makes in writing this finale, people are going to be upset. It's a hard story to finish, especially because it was written so well. Like, you wouldn't think that a game that has kind of these gimmicks and is made by one person who's doing it all would be able to land itself so solidly. I know I bring up the Inescapable stuff a lot, but like, Inescapable was written by a team of professional developers and was sold for like 50 bucks, US. This game was just developed by some guy who did it all. The music is made in GarageBand, he did the art himself, he wrote it himself, someone else did translate it for him, but then he just gave the game away for free. It only became purchasable with money when it got moved to Steam as an early access game, and even then, it's only 15 bucks. I know that he's got a lot of pressure on him to finish the story, I doubt he's ever going to see this video, because why would he? But like, at the end of the day when we're talking about choice, he's really the one making the only choices here. Everything else we do is ultimately just responding to him. As the player of your turn to die, you are in the killing game, or the death game, that Nankadai has set up. He writes the rules, he sets out the referees, all of it is his choice. And, just like with Sarah, being the one with all the power to choose is a fucking burden to carry. However it ends, I can't wait to see it though. Hopefully sooner rather than later though, because it is absolutely rotting my brain to try and figure out what might be going on. But on that note, 
that's where we're going to end this one. This was not supposed to be a super long video, but it turns out that I actually bit off more than I can chew once again by deciding to cover an entire game and deep dive into the concept of choices. But hopefully you've enjoyed it. I feel like people enjoy it more when I'm hating on a game, which is why the Inescapable video did a lot better than like the Buried Stars one did or whatever else. Although I do think the Buried Stars one is really good. If you haven't watched that one, go do that. But anyways, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, all that other good stuff the algorithm likes. If you want to become a channel member and get voting rights for these videos, then you can do so by clicking the join button below for $5 a month. And that support means a lot to me. The next poll is going to starting on July 1st and is going to run until the end of the day on July 7th between these five topics. First up is Hero Bands Aren't the Solution. A returning topic from the first May poll, this video would discuss how and why Hero Bands aren't a solution to the issues Overwatch is facing. Next, there's Blizzard's Panopticon Isn't Working. A returning topic from March and the two May polls, this video would focus on why the style of moderation used for Overwatch fails to actually moderate player behavior. Third up is what Overwatch tells you to care about and why it's a problem. A returning topic from November, January, March, and June, this video would be about how Overwatch's leaderboard causes players to view those stats as the most important, and how that messes with our understanding of individual performances as well as the game as a whole. Next up is time loops, roguelikes, and how genres blend. Our first new topic for July was added to the polls as a donathon reward for MV. This topic would look at how genres in gaming blend together with a particular focus on time loops and roguelikes. Lastly, there's why everyone agrees that sounds important. Our final July topic is also a Donathon reward, this one from Destiny. This topic would explore not only why sound design and music are so important in gaming, but why it seems like nearly everyone seems to agree about that too. Like I said, the poll starts on July 1st, and it will run until July 7th. If none of these topics have a majority by the end of the voting, the top two move on to a three-day runoff, and the topic with the most votes on July 10th at midnight wins. Anyways, with all of that out of the way, thank you to my channel members. Mini Q, Olesp, Cage the Orc, Fish Toast, Alex Stone, Nemo the Survivor, Destiny, Yoshi of the Wire, Catlover192, Sourdough, Aluma Riley, It's Peggy BTW, Cadence, Windex the Great, V, DeLeathers, Gvost, Marsh Alice, Crimson Cyclo, Good Guy Luis, Jules Coolness, Cacteen Kushler, Ikri, Hallucigeno, MV, The Only Enigma, Hazmat, Bad at Games, and Mariah. Whether you're a channel member, a subscriber, or you just clicked on this one out of curiosity, thank you very much for watching, and I hope I'll see you around again soon. Thank <laughs> you.